Have to start the, the meeting of um, February 8th, Water Sewer Commission meeting. Uh, it's now 5 30. I'd like to ask everyone to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic of the which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, visible, the liberty, liberty, and justice for all. <laughs> glad everybody, uh, I know anxiously awaiting when we can do that in person. Certainly, absolutely, Jim. I agree wholeheartedly. Um, okay, without further ado, we're going to get right into the superintendent's update. I think he's got all sorts of fun for us. I've got a few things, uh, just not to go out of order. I know uh, we actually skipped a couple meeting approvals, a uh, meeting yeah. minute approval. No, sir, that's correct, yes. Yeah. One of them was for December 28th, 2021, yeah. and the other was, the, I believe, the last meeting, which is January 25th. Didn't know if you guys had a chance to review those or not, just before we get too far uh, out and forget about uh, getting those taken. Yeah, care. I should have started off with that. Sorry about that. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I looked them over, they seem right to me. Yep, me too. I, I have also some. You want to take care of those right off, right away? Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, so we had, um, what was it December 28th and the 20th, January 25th? Okay, um, I move that we approve the meeting minutes for the December 28th meeting of the Board of Water and Sewer Commissioners. I cannot second. I wasn't there. I, I second it. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, that passes. Okay. Uh, I now move that we approve the meeting minutes for the January 25th meeting of the Board of Water and Sewer Commissioners. I second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Thanks, Frank. You might <clears throat> All right, I'll, I'll jump into the to the meeting minutes here of uh, my own. So uh, thankfully we made it through the uh, the blizzard of 2022. It wasn't as bad as they had forecasted. Um, we actually didn't lose power this time, which is, is pretty impressive. So the work that they've been doing in and around the power lines has uh, definitely been helping out. I hope it stays that way. Um, a large portion of the staff worked with the highway department. Uh, you know, clearing the roads while others, uh, including myself, kept the major facilities open and accessible. Uh, snow clearing operations continued uh, into Sunday and actually into Monday with the uh, heavy equipment down at the wells and, and the sewer stations. And uh, whenever we had people freed up with an extra vehicle, we'd send them out to clear the roads with the highway department. Jump over to well 5A. Because of the uh, cold temperatures that we dealt with and the pending blizzard, uh, we focused our attention on making sure that the generators uh, were up and running, everything was topped off, and we had uh, additional supplies if necessary. So uh, we put off the installation of the electrical conduit at our temporary well 5A location. And uh, crews were out there right after the blizzard, uh, putting about 150 feet of electrical conduit. The intent is that this was installed to be a permanent installation, um, not just temporary. So it was put in per, per building code, inspected. Um, the electrician will actually be out uh, tomorrow to uh, finish pulling the wires, making the actual payload connections with the breakers uh, inside the, the pump station and at the uh, emergency disconnect outside the temporary well. So that uh, that couldn't happen soon enough. Once that- Frank, uh, uh, where is uh, well 5A? Uh, 5A is off of Plain Street. Thank you. Down at the uh, town forest. Thank you. Sure. Um, so once uh, once we get power to that site, we can obviously do the uh, the chlorinate to pump the waste and get a sample off to the lab. Uh, we do still need DEP approval for what is on the site proceeding from the ground. We have uh, scheduled with one of the representatives from Mass DEP Southeast to be out here Thursday morning. <laughs> meet with myself and the uh, primary well operator to do a, a quick walkthrough in the field. Um, that's actually going to take place uh, starting around 10 a.m. And we hope to transition and actually go over to our well three location, where we're also going to ask for their approval for the four lot pipe that we installed uh, at that location so that we can have the, uh, the four lot uh, benefits for that well three location. 
Frank, if I may, um, when yes. did the, elect, uh, the electricians plan on showing up on site? They or do we have them scheduled? Tomorrow, Steve. If all goes well, depending on what's there, um, we may even possibly do a flush to waste and, and pull a sample uh, late tomorrow, but uh, more than likely it will probably be Thursday. Uh, other work that we still have to do there is um, do a temporary fence around the protrusions, which would be later on will be the, the actual well, but uh, DEP is requiring some type of uh, safety fence around that for the what, what is that? What does that entail? Is that top that plastic fence? Is it? No, this is actually gonna. Uh, what we've come up with for the most cost, <clears throat> believe it or not, is gonna be uh, a steel dog kennel or two of them. Okay. Six foot high, you know, heavy gauge steel, uh, posts in the ground, secured to the post. So, uh, you know, it'll be a challenge to uh, to get in. It's a no climb fence. You know, they're not gonna require anything at barbed wire or anything on top of it. And for the most part, we're gonna have staff in and out of there. Um, especially in the beginning, once that well goes online, making adjustments to the flow and, uh, you know, making sure everything is, is where it needs to be. The, uh, Frank, is that fence part of what the requirement before the, even the temporary pump can go online? It is not. They, they definitely want something in place or they want uh, some type of security, you know, yeah. whether it be a camera, physical persons there or something. So uh, that's something we, we intend on getting in this week. But we didn't want to put it in and actually cause a problem with the electrician trying to perform his work. So we kept the site open as possible, and that'll be the last step for that. Uh, we've also actually um, added a secondary 110 power unit out there with a separate breaker. So the intent would be once this goes online that we don't want to shut it off. But if for some reason we did have to shut it off for plant maintenance, and we are still in the middle of February or, or you know, a cold day in March, we actually are going to insulate the exposed section of pipe with a concrete insulating blanket and an oil filled heater uh, underneath, similar to what we use on some of our other locations um, that were problematic if the heat had an issue. So it's uh, it's vegetable oil, it's perfectly safe to be used in the, in the location, it's a sealed unit. Uh, so just we've taken as many precautions as we possibly can, you know, looking forward, especially dealing with the temperatures that we've dealt with. Um, in the past couple of weeks. But, you know, the goal there, providing we have a place to put the additional water, would be to run that station continuously um, until we're outside of the cold snap. So again, like I mentioned, we actually uh, we have the uh, samples in from the bore log pipe that we installed at well three. Uh, Jillian should be out. We'll take her there as well. Hopefully we can get her uh, seal of approval and sign off on that, and that'll have the four-lot virus removal activated once we turn on that loop that we put in. I believe it was 220 feet of pipe. Don't quote me on the numbers, Harry probably remember better than I do. So jumping across, speaking of, we'll stay with water. Um, we've dealt with some leaks. I know I talked to you guys about this in the past, uh, and uh, we had the guys out searching every possible hour of the day when they weren't doing other stuff, looking for leaks in the distribution system. Uh, a few of them have been found. One was at a vacant home. I think I talked to you about this probably two weeks ago. Um, a couple of other ones that surfaced in homes uh, that were partially vacant because the duplex and the neighbor had left and you know, for whatever reason, a window was open or a door was open. Once the, we had the temperature changes, you know, cold and warm, those pipes finally thawed out. I believe there was an issue just the other day at Alberto's. Not sure what it was related to. I did not have our office respond, but I did hear through social media that they were closed due to some type of pipe failure. Don't know if that's weather related or, or a maintenance issue. Frank, did, did any of this um, make a difference with time that uh, our pumps have run? They have. Okay, good. It, it, it has been chipping away at it. Um, so we had a, a significant leak at one of the condo units or townhouse units over on Burke Street uh, that was found. This was actually found, believe it or not, the day before the blizzard. Um, and the way that the unit is plumbed, one shut off feeds six units there. So uh, we obviously you know, couldn't isolate it immediately right then. It wasn't flooding the basement. Um, we had direct contact numbers with the uh, person that was renting that particular. 
so that if there was water starting to seep in, we could respond right away. Uh, we got in touch with the management company there, you know, gave them the typical, uh, you know, it's typically 10 days from the date that we notice the leak or that we're, we're told that the leak happens. Certain circumstances will change that time frame, uh, especially if it's creating a hazard or, or creating damage. We, we lessen, you know, they may be an immediate shutdown depending on what's going on. So we worked with them. We gave them a list of our, <clears throat> excuse me, approved contractors. And uh, one of the gentlemen from the list actually responded and was out there rather quickly, got that exposed. Um, we're all too familiar with this group of condos down there. Uh, it was built long ago when different regulations were in place or not the correct ones. Uh, this is a uh, full plastic that feeds these units. I know, Steve, you're, you're aware of what this is, but for the other guys, basically it's, it's, the same OD wall plastic pipe that we use for our, it matches the copper tube service, but it's a very thin wall. So regular fittings don't work on it. Like the irrigation pipe? The irrigation pipe or, or something you would see, um, yeah, feeding a golf course or something. So it's new. 100 PSI, something. Yep. 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 It's not made to handle the pressures that we run nowadays. Yep. You know, we, we come across this quite a bit. It was you know, perfectly fine back in the 70s and 80s when the system was completely different from what it is now. And uh, what we've noticed is you know, typically the hose clamps rot off, and that's where the leak starts. It's not actually a failure of the pipe, but we've seen that as well. So repairs were made. That was put back on. That one there, we anticipated was a, was a relatively good leak, probably 25 gallons a minute, you know, based on the size inch and a half line coming in. It wasn't a full break, but definitely enough water coming up that, you know, again, it affected our run times. Uh, we did find a couple other smaller leaks. Um, one was actually Monday morning, we were out yesterday, uh, Plain Street. And uh, this was a copper service that actually had corroded based on the proximity to the natural gas main that's in the street there. Um, something we've dealt with in the past, not on Plain Street, but on Burke Street, the, uh, the gas main actually holds an electrical charge that's put there purposely for anti-corrosion. So the gas is hooked up to the electric. Sometimes their charges that they put to it are a little off from where they should be. And any less um, lesser metals are, in our point, it would be the copper service, tend to react poorly to that type of electricity being in the ground and uh, creates electrolysis, creates pinholes, uh, similar to what we see if we have a, an old home with a poorly grounded electrical service or a bad appliance, it'll actually blow a hole through the copper because it's a sacrificial metal. So guys were out, dug that up, replaced a section of that. Uh, then we found, again, it's, this has been the past couple of weeks of leaks. Uh, we were over and responded to a call on North Worcester Street. This was a leak on the homeowner's side. They were aware of it, and oddly enough, when we knocked on the door, they uh, had mentioned that they had anticipated on calling us that day to notify us that the uh, curb box was damaged by the plow and uh, that they were hoping to set up some time to repair it this week when the weather changes. Uh, so crews were out there today repairing that box. It is ready for um, a shutdown so that the owner of the property is going to do the repair there themselves. And uh, the last week that we had was actually Mansfield Ave, the, uh, the cross tie hydrant that we use for emergency connections to you guys see the Mansfield there. There was water in the yard, something that we had noticed when it went away with the cold snap that surfaced again. And uh, upon uh, excavation of that uh, earlier this morning, the uh, repair coupling that was installed many, many years ago had actually loosened up. Um, it's a transition coupling from ductile iron pipe to AC that actually feeds that hydrant lateral. Uh, so that was you know, a simple repair out of all of them. It was tightened up and uh, yeah. So I think the combination of all these leaks combined is definitely going to affect uh, our operational run times. We won't actually know until tomorrow morning. So now that all of these leaks have been taken care of, you know, if we actually did knock it down a significant amount, uh, you know, we still have to perform our normal duties with the, uh, you know, flushing our filters to waste and, and all of those numbers um, change depending on the amount of sediment that we remove uh, and flush. So tomorrow, we're looking for. 
Yeah, good job. Not easy to find a leak. They are they are not fun. Um, not big enough to, to create a huge panic, and especially when there's multiple small ones like this. Um, you know, our, we have the correlators, which are a very expensive piece of equipment. But uh, you know, with a continuous leak like this, typically the ground noise um, in areas that we have direct ferry electric is louder than the leak, and there's no way to isolate it. So we're limited by what we have for technology, other than just going out and pounding the pavement, looking at houses that we have on the list that are vacant, or uh, you know, reaching out to the public, asking them to keep an eye on certain things that uh, you know, if you see something in the puddle that doesn't go away. Definitely. crossings. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. And something I just want to bring up real quick. I know Steve Peterson could probably talk a little bit more about this. Um, at the last meeting, I had mentioned, and Mr. Bernstein had offered to go to um, some meetings in the future, uh, either uh, EPA or Mass DEP. Uh, there are some upcoming changes with the sewer regulations that uh, we were involved with uh, two Zoom meetings. And it will um, be something that we have to deal with, even though we are just a collection system. So we're waiting for a little bit more information to come across on this. Uh, but it sounds like they're looking for different types of materials in the waste. And where we're a combined system, we would most likely need to sample our soil independently before it gets to the combined sewer so that the MFN would be able to determine um, charges based on what is found in our waste. It's, uh, it was, the meetings were, were pretty intense, they were pretty long, a couple hours long. A lot of people on there weren't very happy with it, um, people that are already involved with the permitting and the, uh, the processes that they have to do. It sounds like there's a lot of redundant paperwork that's gonna come down from EPA that's going to mimic stuff that they already do from Mass EDP. Um, but changes will happen for the people like ourselves that add, uh, don't add chemical and just actually pump it along. So I know uh, Steve Peters and I have talked a little bit behind the scenes about this. And I think we'll, we'll be talking more in the future. Uh, one of the, the wonderful words there that they're looking for is the PFAS. You know, they find it in wastewater and now they have to deal with how to remove it. Um, there were some other items that were in there, I believe aluminum or aluminum sulfate was one of them, which is a, a process that's used in uh, wastewater and water treatment. So yeah, they're looking for, I think they're looking to set DTEC limits and then actually have an MCL if you have a violation over that amount and try and determine where it's going to come from. Because obviously the end user, which in our case would be MFN, has to pay to deal with um, getting rid of those uh, whether it be heavy minerals or, or whatever it may be. So obviously our cost to the MFN could be affected drastically mm -hmm. if something's found in the Norton sewer and not um, particularly in any other sewer that goes to the MFN. Uh, we'll definitely keep you posted on that. Mr. Bernstein, if we can get you in on a, on a few of the next meetings, we'll gladly link you in on those. Um, hey. It's all new to us, but I know Westland Sampson, I don't know if Steve himself was involved, but I know they had planned on having uh, a representative there because they know it is going to be impactful to uh, a lot of the users where we haven't had issues in the past. Yeah. So I wasn't, I wasn't there, Frank. We had several guys, several people there, excuse me. And um, I did reach out today um, and we're still waiting for a debrief. They're going to put um, some information together on, on what they came away with. But I believe that um, so you're talking about probably two different um seminars it would be all related to the same thing and i know there's stuff with the uh reporting on the sanitary sewer overflows and stuff like that i don't know how that relates to the sampling you're talking about i think that was a different a separate seminar which you know i know we also had people at so i'll just um have to compile that information and uh, you find out what what we found out yeah, you're right. There were seminars. Um, one of them was based on sanitary uh, discharges that will make its way to groundwater or surface water if it should be a pond or something. Um, that was, I believe, an SSO. And then there was another one that was a, a, a CSO, which was a combined uh, right. super flow. Um, that was a, a different meeting with different reporting that's required. 
Um, there's a plan that has to be drafted for that in any areas that you believe could affect one another. So basically, I think it would be everything in town because the needs areas typically yeah. go around the areas that are wet, or be a pond or you know something like Winnicott or uh, you know you know so that have King Philip that have Charlotte, you know anything okay. down the Grove area. So I'll, I'll have to get a better understanding because I don't know. I guess I don't understand that. The CSOs, I don't see how they impact you because you're a you're not a combined system and man you don't connect to a combined system. Like Mansfield is all separate sanitary, right? There's no combined sewer connected to that. So um, I, I guess I just got to give our understanding of, of of what they are, what it's requiring of of you non CSO communities. I know you're impacted by the the SSO reporting measures. I don't know how impacted you are by the by the CSO stuff. Right. Yeah, there was definitely a lot of information to take in and those meetings. You know, both John and I were in attendance there and we, we both come out of it scratching our head with more questions than we had um, that were even asked in the meeting. Um, we are still waiting on documents to be sent over from that meeting and I believe um, they were going to also answer all of the questions that were in the chat and forward those to all the people that signed up for the meeting. So that should answer quite a few of the questions um, that were there. The um, some of the other issues that came up that were eye-opening in that is that even the private sewer systems, um, you know, a couple of them come to mind here in town. Depending on the size of their capacity, they also would be affected by having to do this reporting. Uh, so that's one of the biggest changes that I think everybody was really surprised about, and. Uh, any of the reporting, the restrictions on the timeline. Uh, they want media access. Um, they want um, reverse 911. You know, so some of that was some of the big big takeaways from it. Uh, you know, a lot of people don't have the opportunity to do that. So th there's definitely some changes I think that we'll see coming down the road. But I just want to make sure you guys are aware, of just a basic idea of what's going on behind the scenes. Well, these private. Uh, systems that are subject to this, will that have to go through our, our department or is that 100% on them? No, 100% on them and it was based on capacity um, of what they have. So depending on what size pumping station they have, yeah. they either were or weren't you know, affected by this. Um, but I think regulations are in place regardless of capacity that uh, there needs to be warning um, capabilities. You know, if there was a failure, if it's going to get to a certain point, run for a certain time. You know, it, it was pretty involved. It's not like they, they spent quite a bit of time with these regulations that uh, are actually already in place. Um, I believe the enforcement date was July 6th when um, we need to have your plans and everything in for them if you fit the certain criteria. We definitely have some time. Just want to make sure you guys are aware that there's uh, some changes coming. Whether how much it affects us exactly, I can't say right now. Deal with that when it comes down the pike. <laughs> so uh, that's that's basically all I got. I jumped around a little bit, but that covers uh, definitely covers what I have for updates for you guys. That was short and sweet. I try. All right. Yeah. All right. So uh, next on the agenda, we have uh, 286 South Wister Street. Uh, do we have someone here on that, or is that so we we have the um, literature on that? I don't believe that they had planned on attending, if I remember hearing correctly. Oh, okay. Um, Can we give us a little background on this, please? Yeah. So this was one of the locations. So we go out and we do our meter reading um, quarterly. If for some reason the meter doesn't read um, or is a partial read, we obviously notice that when we come back to the to the office here and download the readings. Notices would be then handed out to each of those locations indicating that you know, we were unable to obtain the meter reading. Please contact us um, to uh, be part of the meter change out program. You know, typically these are meters that are 10 years and older that just typically fail. Um, and you know, what has to happen for the billing cycle is Rose or now Brooke would go back and look at the previous usage for that particular quarter 
and input that in. So it's, it should be fairly close to the accurate amount of usage for that time frame of the year. And the bill would be sent out. It would be an estimated bill printed on, on the copy with an E instead of an A for actual. Um, usually within, you know, a couple of weeks, we hear from the customer, we respond, put in the meter, update the information in the computer and, and all as well. In situations such as what happened here, we didn't hear from the customer. Another billing cycle had started. We went out red. It was estimated again. The billing software doesn't allow us to put in a lesser number once you move forward. So now you add a couple to that last previous reading that was in there. Two, four, whatever, whatever the number may be. And usually it's the second or sometimes the third round that um, you know the customer will notice this bill just seems a little off for this time of year. You know, again, if we had gone out a second time and the meter didn't work, we would have left another red card or yellow card indicating we need to get in and change the meter. Please contact us. Um, so this customer notices after the second round of bills were estimated. Uh, based on regulations, within 30 days, they have the right to dispute the bill, which is what they are doing here. Um, they acknowledge that the bill was similar in charge the first time it was estimated. Um, obviously, it was more this last time it was, was around because we had to add a couple to it to show usage in the computer. And that's what they're disputing, is that when the meter was replaced, the numbers on the meter were lower than what was generated by the computer estimate, which we billed them for. The problem with this is we have no way of knowing or verifying the accuracy of the meter once it stopped reading, whether it was an effective meter, whether it had some debris get jammed up inside it, you know, or it was just the battery wore out and it wasn't transmitting or reading. Meters aren't tested once they are taken out of service unless it's requested by the homeowner. And it's so also they, paid for the homeowner. Okay. If it tests accurately. Um, do, they, do they know they had that option? I don't know if they had that option or not because it wasn't asked for. Um, okay. Typically, it is, it is an option for everybody to ask to have their meter tested. Uh, most times they don't want to pay the $75 fee uh, because it's $75 charged to them if the meter comes back accurately. If it comes back and it's incorrect, which I've never seen, then obviously we eat the cost. We change the bill or, or make whatever adjustments are necessary. Uh, but we choose this style meter because of its accuracy. Um, you know, obviously components fail. We've had a few meters that, you know, get a piece of debris jammed in there. The water still flows through perfectly fine, but the reading stops. So the only way to verify that the reading, you know, was accurate would have been to have that meter tested once it was removed. But again, just something that, that's not normal practice. Once a meter fails, whether it be age or degree or whatever, you know, it's recycled when new meters installed. Yeah. So and we have uh, to be <clears throat> sorry, please, sorry. Please please go ahead, Jim. I was just gonna say so the meter um it has to be a request from the homeowner to have it tested. Right. So um, but if they happen, don't yeah, go ahead, Jim. No, so if they don't ask us to test it. Is there, is they have a, like a time that they have to come to us to ask us to test it or, um, and if it doesn't get tested, then w what are the repercussions of that then? Is that, that leaves so, them no recourse or? Well, yes, basically there is no recourse. What happens when a meter is requested to be tested, typically they're disputing a bill um, or they don't believe that the recording that is on the meter is accurate. So then there's a different process that happens. You know, normally we go in, the guys rip the meter out, throw it in a bucket with other meters that were changed for the day. It goes in the back of the truck. It gets cleaned out at the end of the week or whenever they have a light day. If a meter was requested to be tested, different procedures take place. Obviously, we, we take it out. We cap both ends. You know, it's, it's stored differently. It's stored inside the building. It's tagged. And we immediately call the testing company that we use, uh, Regan Supply and Testing. So to do that with all of the meters, you know, in place, it, it's just not a normal practice for us. I but even in this situation, it was just, the, it, it wasn't working. It wasn't that it was giving the false reading. It just wasn't giving any reading, right? Correct. It, it had stopped working. We had left two cards, you know, very similar to what we do more often than not, you know, probably 15 to 20 times each reading cycle. We have a small group of meters that has reached its age and has either stopped recording or, you know, it doesn't, it's still recording and not actually giving the signal 
to the electronic meter. So these meters have a built-in right. battery, and you know it gives a signal when we go by with the drive-by system. Okay. Now, in regards to the bill that they have now, uh, is it much larger, than, or is it much more than they normally get at this time of the year? Looks like it's a lot more, Steve. It would be a lot more than what they would normally okay. see this time of year. So, I mean, w without without testing this meter, we don't. This meter kind of needs to be tested for us to really, in my mind, to make a decision on on how we can approach this bill. I mean, uh, unless we just do a, a, an average across the board what they've done the last couple of years and do a, an, an average bill. Well, it looks like um, the 38 that was come up with was the average of 34 and 41, I guess, the previous two years of that same period. But the next period where he's getting charged 40, it was an 18 and a 16. So the average would be 17. So he's getting almost double charged for, in theory, what he probably used. Um, I'm, I'm not sure how we, we go about addressing that, but. So it's so Frank, if in theory, if if somebody never, if you kept sending notices out every month, every quarter, and no one ever called you back and just kept paying the estimated fee, then every quarter that estimated fee will just continually going up by a couple for the foreseeable future. Then, right? Exactly. Is there any way we can change the programming so that it can keep doing averages, or does it have to go? has to be more than the previous. Is that like in a bylaw or something or? I don't know if it's in a bylaw or anyway. It's just the way that it's always been, been done in the past. You know, it was based Say on- also that part of the reason we estimate the bills high is to get the customer's attention that they need to have their meter changed. Oh, right, right. Uh, and, just know, for, and just so you know as well, uh, other towns do this the same process. Yeah. Um, they, I, I've talked to other billing supervisors, and they do the same. They'll they'll do it higher if they're not getting any response from the numerous yep. times we've sent a card out or what it may be. Yeah, yeah. that seems it's to be since I've been here. You know, the first or even sometimes the second bill is generated based on a computer average, and then typically, you know, if we don't see a response, it goes up one or two units. You know, so each time it shows that there is still usage on that home and it's not flagged as, as uh, you know, a vacant home. It can, you know, again, multiple cars yeah. go out. It's gotten to the point we've even sent letters out to a few of the homes. Um, some people have flat out refused us to go in, not this one particular, but, you know, historically we have had some challenges getting into some of the homes. You know, this is just a yeah. different here. Are they, are they on town sewer as well there? No, no, not 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 okay. No. So this is just a water issue. Um, this is just a water issue, correct. I mean, I don't know what you guys uh, think, uh, but it's it was, it's it's bad timing for him because the the first estimated one it looks like is it's his highest quarterly usage. If it had been six months earlier, it would have started really low, and it would ended up being in his favor. I mean, is it consistent over the last few years for this homeowner? What I'm looking at, it seems to seems to trend annually. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely uh, it, it trends up to to that the September fifth reading that quarter, and then it trends down from there. So that's his highest usage. I don't know. That just seems weird to me. That that that, that um, I I totally get it. But it's almost, it's almost like it's, um, like you said, it's to, to, to get somebody to realize they need to get the water meter changed. So it's, it's almost like a penalty, really, a little bit. Would that, um, would that, would that penalty, be, I mean, you, you, we still have to, we still have to bill accordingly. Yeah. And is it, a, is it, to adjust the bill, if we were to do that, it would have to be some sort of average, the last couple of years of average, looking at their bills to make sure that we're consistent with what their usage is generally, generally is. And so for the last couple of years or so in that time. Frame. 
Oh, I, I, absolutely. The, only, the problem is that the quarter after the quarter in question, the second quarter he got billed for is his, it's half of what he's, his previous usage would be. The 38 he got charged is right in line with his fall with his fall quarter, I guess, from the previous couple of years, at least for the, right. the status report I'm looking at. Right. So, so, Steve, you're saying that average the previous two or three years from – September to December bill is what you're saying, right? From, from that time, from, from that billing time, period, yes, correct. Right. Not seeing, I don't have that in front of me, but not, uh, you know, that's, that's just my train of thought. I, I kind of agree with you. What I'm looking at though, it's going to, it's going to basically chop his bill and chop that bill in question in half. I don't know if that's, um, going to end up working out in our favor or his favor or what. So but, Frank, uh, Frank, how often does this happen? It's a good this question. Is not, this is not something that's very common. Uh, okay. We have, uh, like I said, maybe maybe 15 meters uh, each quarter that uh, we may have to go out there and replace. Uh, typically, once the notices are sent out, the guys are out within a couple of weeks changing those meters out. So it's not this is not a common practice that we see an issue. Um, I think again here was probably the perfect storm. It was the, yeah. the billing cycle that mimicked the previous billing cycle, so it didn't, you know, pose any concern to the resident that this bill might be a little bit higher. Um, obviously, it definitely wasn't lower because it has to be based on an average um, until the second time came around. Uh, you know, the only concern here, obviously, e each one is taken differently. You know, looking at the meter. If the meter reading stopped at a certain point, we don't, we can't verify the accuracy of how much went through there. Uh, so we have to be very cautious about what we average and how many times we do this without having verification, you know, for the water that really went through. I mean, we probably have more water in the leaks that I talked about earlier than we're talking about go through this meter, but everything is supposed to be accounted for. Well, without us proving what the accuracy is on this meter, we're kind of hard pressed not to average out a bill over, over looking at, like John said, the last couple of years, like, you know, in that time frame. And I know it's dominant, but we had to kind of knock on the door, as it were, with, with uh, boosting it up. So they notice it. And I don't know, it's, it's kind of a, to me, it's kind of a hard thing to I, I win, if you want to call it a win. I don't want to see anyone pay anything more than they don't than, that that they're not, you know, supposed to pay. But on the other hand, <clears throat> you get their attention. Yeah, it, it's it, it's it's all that the whole his, his first estimated one. He probably didn't realize it was estimated because it came pretty much in line <laughs> with what he would pay in that quarter. Yeah. You know? So he probably didn't even he may not even know, have noticed it. Although I'm sure he would have noticed the car that we left or at some point, you know. So it is, it is, I think, still a little on him for letting it go. And after we did do our due diligence. Ago. Yeah, we did our due diligence yeah. as a, as as a as a as a water department by leaving notices and trying to contact and as best we can. Um, it is a sticky situation though because the numbers that I'm looking at from the previous two years, it's it's a little more than double what he. He probably used. So I'm, I'm I'm sure if I were him, I would probably be like, "Why am I getting charged so much water?" Jim get stuck there. He is stuck. Yeah. Steve, <laughs> what do you think? Well, I think we have to stay with a stated policy. Ben and I can rewrite the rules. And I don't know if, what our regulations stipulate, but I think we have to well, follow the regulations. I don't know that there is a stated policy on this exactly. They have 30 days to dispute a bill, and I believe they came to us within the 30 days. So, so I guess um, we can average it for the second and make the exception to the rule, and so be it. I, I know I know this is the first one that I've seen since I've been on the board. It's gotten, it's gotten to this point of this of this nature. 
So on the one we authorize Frank to adjust the bill and have him file for a um, rebate based on our, what we just talked about. So we want to take, uh, we, we think about taking an average of the last couple of years of what he did in that, in that billing cycle. Right. Correct. I think that's not, a, I think that's really not much more we can do at this point. I think we should just authorize Frank and John to just come up with a number and proceed. Do we need a vote on that, John, um, Frank, or is that something uh, we can just authorize? You no, know, for a change in the bill, I, I would I would be comfortable with having a vote on it, just in case there's any questions asked later. Uh, that way, we also in the minutes. Again, it's something that's not typical. You know, we usually don't get to this step. Yeah. Uh, you know. Okay. Um, what happened Jim, to John? Did Jim run away on us? Jim seemed to have left the flock here. Okay. Good news, Jim. You're right. He must be. Uh... Then we do. Do we uh, need a motion to evade the bill at uh, two eighty six South Winster Street? In terms of doing an average over the last couple of years within that billing cycle. I'm not sure what that billing cycle is. Is it, is it uh, September, October, November? <clears throat> Excuse me. You know what that billing cycle is, Frank? I do not have that in front of me. I'm sorry. We, we will adjust. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's from September 1st to December 1st. We'll look at the last couple of years of that time frame of September 1st to December 1st and, and, and give an average bill to the homeowner. That, uh, does that suffice, John, uh, Frank? That works for me. I second that. Second. Hey, okay. I lost my internet for a little bit there. Did you hear what we just did? I did not. <laughs> okay. Um, just made a motion to um, update the bill at 286. Um, is it South Worcester? Yeah. South Worcester yeah. Street. Yep. Um, we're going to go to the last couple of years of the billing cycle of September 1st to December 1st and, 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 some, and give them an average bill. Okay. And for now. Yep. Yeah, I, I'm okay with that. All right, so Steve seconded it. So all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, abatement. All right. Those all right. terms. Thanks, Sorry, Thanks John. Thanks, All right, moving right along. Um, we got the TP Trail water service discussion. Um, I think we. Do we all know anything about this? Uh, the spaghetti lines, as we had spoken. Yeah. I didn't know if uh, you had. Yeah. Okay. All right. So Frank, you want to just give a little overview, and we'll talk a little more about this. Exactly. Talk, talk a little bit about this. We were supposed to have uh, somebody in. Oh, okay. Let's, I'm sorry. Um, we'll they're on, unless they are. Maybe they called in. Uh, not seeing. Is that, Is anyone out there from uh, the TP Trail? I don't people? see anybody. Right. Well, well, we can, if, if you want, we can bring that up after a couple of things and um, give them another chance. If they, if they want to log on, they'll log on. If not, then we'll just maybe table it. <clears throat> Moving on to Island Brook, utility connections. Do we have anyone here <laughs> from Island Brook? I've not seen anybody other than us on here. Yeah. Okay. What are we going to do in that case? Just table it till the next meeting? Frank, yeah. you haven't email or anything about anyone not being able to get on, have you? Yeah, if I, uh, let me go check the email. If I get off uh, by accident, I will log back on. All right. Well, in the meantime, we can, uh, we have Steve Peterson and I believe Parrots with us tonight. So maybe we could um, do some Western Samson updates while we uh, check on those emails. Uh, Steve? 
Would you like to begin? Sure. Um, Thank, you. Thank you. I would add, can you guys hear me okay? Yep. Get my video too so you can see. Um, I guess I would just add to that. I don't know if you're bound by the times on the agenda. So Island Brook technically isn't on until 645, so they may not be on yet. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Right. There wasn't paying attention to that. That's all right. And the other caller is technically that's a, now. That's a, that's a rookie move. Yeah. I'm pretty sure they weren't told to uh, get on early in case things sped up faster than anticipated. I mean, it's not a hearing, so it's not a posted hearing time. It's just that's where they're listening. That's okay. We'll, we'll call again at 645. That's fine. Thanks, Steve. Yeah. Yep. Um, so we can touch base on that. I, the so one of the things I had was the Island Brook um, information. We obviously, I sent an email out today just trying to give yep. some input um, yep. on that and where we're at. Um, we'll obviously have to talk about it with the developer. Um, Steve, you had asked for our set of plans to go along with that. I haven't seen those plans either. I believe you said that. So I know they've presented the that. I don't know that we have. Uh, Frank, I don't think you have an electronic version at this point of the plans, oh. or or do we? I know they showed them. You know, the last time they were in in person, they showed mm -hmm. the plans physically. No, I, I don't know if they left hard copies. Uh, book, yeah. I no, I do not have electronics on that. Um, we do have the hard copies here. Uh, mm -hmm. Typically, we don't uh, prefer the electronics just because they are so hard to uh, to manage yeah. to look at things, and when we do transition to the work in the field, the hard copy set is what goes out and actually gets marked up on. Uh, I can request um, electronic copy to be sent over seeing as we are still virtual. Yeah, that's all. It's just not having it in front of us to, to look at is, is a little bit tricky, but I get the gist of it. Um, you know, and I would just say, obviously, you know, along those lines, we're all obviously interested you know, the commission has posed the option. Everyone's interested in seeing them connect out the back with the sewer. Yep. Um, I don't know. They'll need to answer whether they've advanced that at all, either with, you know, Mansfield, you know, with the MFN or with the property owner out there um, and what the real issues are as to why that's not advancing. Mm -hmm. and if the other issues come up, I, I laid out a few ideas you know frank i know there's a lot of it gets a little dicey you know based on their plan right now they, they want to put in a pump station um, collect everything by gravity on their site so they and then they just need to move it off their site and so if the force main then needs to come out <laughs> 23 um you know we really don't recommend and we haven't allowed connections to force main on uh, municipal stations, you know, like we ran into at the town center pump station, yeah. um, where the people on Plain Street and Pine Street were questioning why they couldn't connect to the sewer. Um, so if it is indeed going to be a dedicated, you know, pump station with a dedicated force main, I think, you know, as far as, you know, one of your comments is we have to leave, you know, we they have to extend the sewer consistent with what the plan for sewer in the areas along the way are. I would offer that the best option might be to have them size that pump station for that, you know, for some future connections from that immediate service area. Um, but that's just something you guys need to think about. I, mean, I, think, I think that's a great idea. idea. I, I think that's a tremendous idea. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Especially with the town hall right down the street. If yeah. that's even and they, could, they, they could do that. They could do that regardless of where they go into the MFN, even if they went to the back lot. Yeah, it's just they could um, still size the pump station big enough for. Yeah, and it's it, it's not going to be it's still not going to make it a a real large station. It's not a huge service area, so it's not going to yeah. make it unreasonably large. You know, it's not going to change it from a you know submersible type station to something a lot bigger. It should still be well within the realm of a submersible type station similar to what we did you know it's a lot smaller than what we did at uh at the housing authority property so um it's something to consider it's just as far as it, it seems like then the actual 
gravity sewer infrastructure is something that you guys would entertain down the road. I don't know that you know, we're not ready to get into that right now. It's just having the, the main infrastructure in place for that down the road. And as far as the, and I know Frank, there's additional concerns about, you've already got one private sewer on the other side of 123, having another private um, force main in 123, if that ends up being, for whatever reason, the way they have to go, if everything else doesn't go through. Um, you know, I think you have to consider measures, you know, maybe put more measures in terms of inspection of the installation, you know, oversight of it, and record keeping as far as where everything is and having better data on where it is. It's not a significantly long stretch, but it's not his impact. It's not so much a concern about keeping the data and doing the inspections on it. It's who's responsible for it when it comes time to mark it out. The yeah. issues we have with the private sewer that's out there now um, on both sides of the uh, municipal interceptor there, uh, those people don't get notified and nobody knows how to contact those people if they want them to be notified. And I'm talking about North Cottage and the, uh, the Lemon Street project with Condac. You know, you got a, a huge sewer main running down the middle of the road and nobody has a contact for anybody, you know, to do a mark out there. If you call Dig Safe, it's not a member utility because they're not large enough to be part of Dig Safe, you know, which would be the solution for all. Um, but uh, you know, same thing with, with uh, North Cottage. You know, they're not a member. Uh, they don't have staff that's on hand 24/7 to respond and mark it out if somebody hits a pole or somebody hits a hydrant. You know, anytime we go out there. We have a general idea of where it is. If we have to do a hydrant on that side, you know, we'll pull out what we used to believe were great plans, and now we found them to be, you know, basically trash. You know, the work that's going on out there with the Mass DOT project has proved that that sewer main is not where it shows on the plans. You know, it was struck twice, I believe, um, after it was marked out by a private contractor for North Cottage when they were putting in the uh, guy wires for the telephone poles. You know, some 15 feet off from where it shows on the plants. Um, anytime they've come across and had to upgrade the water services out there when they're doing the transition from the small main to the large main, they found that water main within inches of the sewer main. You know, something that never should have been allowed. Yeah. Right. Yeah. There's, there's multiple yeah. problems out there with that line, which is one of the reasons why we will not take that over. Um, it, it, it's there. It's it's in, in use right now, but uh, it's inferior. Um, I wish we would have known more about it, you know, uh, years ago, because done something and they corrected the problem with what we deal with now for uh, availability up on 123. How old is that line, Frank? When did they put North Cottage in? North Cottage had been there for quite a while, but I believe that line went in thousands. One uh, yeah. interceptor there. Uh, Steve probably has a better accurate date on that. But, um, so I see a, um, a CONCOM sign. It looks like 2004. I have an old set of design drawings from 2004 that are not the as built and are not actually in terms of where they have to get installed. But, um, and then there was a set of plans done that was, um, I think, for the commission as built plan. Those were done by Yarmouth Engineering that are a little more accurate to where it actually is. It, 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 at least in relative terms, it shows it on the right, the correct side of the road. Yes. And where it crosses the river and all of that. Yeah. But, um, and those were done in 2010. So I think those were sometime after the pipe was put in. Somewhere in that 2005 time frame is, is when it was made. So it's not that old. Yeah. In the grand scheme. Um, and I get all those things. I mean, let's, and then we, if they're going to come on, um, we'll see where they're at. And, you know, really, you know, has any, I mean, Frank, the town hasn't had any discussions with MFN in terms of what they will allow out there. Or, or. No, I, I didn't take it upon myself to reach out. Oh, to these them. guys should be reaching out to them. Yeah. So I, I'd just, just be curious if they've gotten any feedback from them. Okay. So why right. do they have to contact them? Because they're connecting into a force main? Or why are they, why are they connecting into directly into uh, Mansfield? Why are they? Uh, contacting them. I don't understand. So the MFN. Yeah. You're referring to, right? Yes. 
So, so yep. the interceptor super out there is owned by the MFN. There's an interceptor in the uh, in the railroad that I can actually share my screen. That's fancy. Uh, yeah, let's see. <clears throat> Yeah, so Steve, to your question, the the, uh, the MFN owns the interceptor pipe, the uh, the large transmission sewer main that goes through multi communities. There, um, they maintain the easement, they maintain the pipe, and they have specific requirements um, for no direct connections to it. So they actually require manholes to be put in on on either side of the main prior to making a, a, a direct connection to it. Um, that's all handled by Mansfield, and uh, that's why they would need permission from them. Uh, to connect also to show that they have the sewer flow available um, that will be going to the MFN because that needs to be added to their, their quantities. Okay, I understand now. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, yeah, because there isn't currently a municipal sewer in front of them that, uh, that is already connected to the MFN. If I don't know if that, so that figure, can you guys uh, see my screen? Oh. Okay, I, I just X out, so I stopped. So that's fine. Um, so I guess we'll wait and see what they have to offer without going any further on this. Um, I did send, so Frank, I sent you today, we've been talking about um, the town uh, municipal complex sewer options. Um, so I did send you a figure today. I don't know if we really want to get into that, but at some point we're going to sit with um, the town manager and the planner uh, planning department to discuss potential options um and it kind of dovetails with this because again we're still out on on route 123 um let me try again so this here um can you guys see this now oh i see what i'm doing here i'm used to teams so there's like multiple uh -huh. buttons here. so now i should be sure you gotta hit share like three times. Oh, there you go. Mm, that's pretty. Yeah, yeah isn't it? So, um, yeah. again, this is that same uh, stretch of 123. So the town <clears throat> municipal complex is here. Um, really, the options that you can even consider um, for sewering it. You know, start with what's in 123. Um, you've got the private sewer from North Cottage. Which we've talked at nauseam about recently. Mm -hmm. that, um, we don't want to see that happen. You know, the, the sewer department wants nothing to do with with taking over that line, and that's what would happen if the town were to tie the complex into that line. Um, so another option for them would be to run this run a force main themselves, build a pump station at their site, which they're going to have to do anyway, probably down yeah. close to where the highway garage is, and it's just about where they can pump it to. So they can pump it all the way. To the same basic location that we're talking about now for Island Brook. And that's a long stretch down 123. And that's what I was saying in my other email. You know, with the opportunity of Island Brook and the town complex, we probably should look at it in terms of each side of the Rumford River. I think whatever goes in at Island Brook could ultimately handle the stuff on the west side, you know, basically yep. between Rumford River and the interceptor sewer. Um, and then whatever gets developed at the town hall complex could, you know, be designed to accommodate any properties east of the Rumford River up to the town yeah. complex. But, you know, as far as what the other options are, so that's kind of options one and two. Um, option three is these red lines here are all uh, sewer, Wheaton College sewers, private Wheaton College sewers. They're probably the closest ability to tie into and those end up flowing down to the pump station that was built on Wheaton. The problem there is we don't have a lot of confidence or know a lot about the, the Wheaton system itself. So if you entertain tying into those, um, you know, A, you'd have to coordinate with Wheaton and they'd most likely expect you to take over the section of the city. You know, so we're back into taking on lines with the vendor systems. So and we had no involvement in the installation. So from there, it goes to two other options. One is to try and find a way to get it over to the existing um, sewers that were installed recently at the intersection of uh, 123 and 140. Um, 
which will be challenging in terms of trying not to dig up the roads that have, you know, mm -hmm. A, you can't go into the roads that have been recently paved because there's a moratorium on that. And um, it's, it's going to be challenge, challenging in itself. So the one last option that that we were going to investigate, and basically we're going to just offer to put a memo together that you know lays out these alternatives and, and put some costs and you know advantages, disadvantages, challenges to each of these. So the last one would be to come out Miller Terrace uh, and go up Elm Street and connect to the uh, existing sewers over on Reservoir. Um, it would, uh, it's probably the longest of the options, but it might open up some opportunities along Elm Street um, to provide super property. Um, so really just the background and, you know, this is something that the town manager is requesting some kind of study so they can figure out the best way to tie it in. It's something that the town um, is going to pay for this study outside of the, the water and sewer department. But obviously I want to work closely with, with Frank on the alternatives that we that we provide. And I call them alternatives, you know, because we have to write them off. You know, we no longer really consider the connection to the private sewer an alternative, but that's where they were envisioning going. So we have to make sure we explain to them why we don't want them using that. So. Just some concepts um, for how to do that. And we'll see how the discussions go with uh, with the town manager and the, and the planner in terms of how far they want us to go with that. So Frank, we need to set up a time to meet with them. Um, I don't know who else needs to be involved um, with that meeting, but you and I can chat about that. So the other thing that we have is tomorrow night is a meeting with the EDC, the Economic Development Commission. Um, has asked ask you guys to uh, come in and, and I think basically talk about the um, the sewer plan in terms of um, sustainability and growth and how it falls into their plan. So all I was I did put together a quick PowerPoint. I don't really want to take up a lot of your time right now, but we could kind of slide through this real quick. Um, Steve, are you uh, planning to attend tomorrow night, Steve Bishop? Yes. Okay, so it's, and Frank, you and I will, um, will be there. I think all, all I set up here, and, and if we need to, we can set up a time before the meeting tomorrow night to run through this if you guys would like. It really just lays out what you guys have done. I mean, the planning is in place through your comprehensive wastewater management plan. We've already given presentations, and so all I did was take you know, information from the public meeting and public hearing and lay it out for them. And to go through the um, the history of planning that goes back to the mid 70s and culminates recently with the most recent between 2015 and 2017, we completed the final comprehensive wastewater management plan and a single environmental impact report, um, which was dated uh, 2017. Um, and that's really the, the document that stands right now. Um, and I think what they really want to see, and we can just give them, like I said, just some background about, you know, what we, you know, why we did it, reestablish what the needs areas were, look at some alternatives, um, pursue the recommended areas and outline a plan for implementation and then highlight that, you know, there have been public <coughs> outreach, public participation um, done. When we first got involved with the studies, you know, the existing, there were three existing treatment plants, which, which still exist. You know, there's Mansfield, Taunton, and the middle school as far as treatment facilities that are in some way used by the town of Norton. But the existing sewage areas um, were these areas here, Knollwood, Norton Grove, northern portion of Mansfield Ave, uh, private sewer and Commerce Park, and then Lake Winnicott. I think this map here, uh, and Steve um, Bernstein, this was the map that I provided. Um, you were asking for a map of the sewers. This is probably the best map that the town has. The, the pink or purple areas are the ones I just 
identified. So this can show them, you know, these are the areas that are currently sewer, because I don't know how much they know about the sewer system. We want to know. And then the blue areas really identify what was identified as the the highest needs areas um, for sewer. And it really focused on finishing around the reservoir um, and then the, the 123 corridor um, with some areas up on North Worcester Street um, that had some needs. And the things that really established the needs, you know, so Jen, just to summarize that, we have divided the town into a total of 11 study areas and ranked them. And those needs areas were the, the ones that we identified um, in need of sewers. And it really comes down to soil limitations, suitability for on-site systems, lot size and density, um, natural resource areas, on-site system performance, and then to some degree economic factors. Um, and these are the different things that we looked at in each of the areas um, as far as what could be done, ultimately coming down to the last bullet you know, the, the highest priority needs areas are the ones that were recommended for the, you know, some uh, form of connection to the centralized system. And I think, like I said, you know, ultimately what the plan right now is to serve the main commercial area from the center of the town out and finish sewing around the reservoir. So those are the areas that, that we're focused on. Okay. And we can just run through those areas <coughs> with them. Um, with these figures here. So areas two and three are the areas below the reservoir. Um, and again, um, you know, dense, dense housing around the reservoir and, you know, the environmental concerns um, are the main reasons that those areas qualify. When we did the CWMP, the infrastructure wasn't in place down here around Wheaton and on uh, Route 123 that could support those areas. So we started in other areas specifically um, area six. So we've now installed the main pump station at Wheaton. It's gonna take on uh, flow from all of these needs areas eventually and pumps it out, picks up the North School and pumps it out to the interceptor. Um, we also started to delve into area seven and the, the way the sewers got built was driven by um, multiple factors. You know, Wheaton came to the table um, contributed a significant um, amount of the money to extend that sewer. They gave us the land that we needed for the pump station and, and that was the most important piece of the infrastructure. The housing authority came along more recently up here. So we've extended the sewer up to the housing authority. Um, and then future plans are at some point to continue along 123. Uh, and like I said, up into the areas below the reservoir. <laughs> Um, and with the infrastructure that we put in place, you know, we can now support the areas around the reservoir. We have the, the sewers up to that point where we need to connect the reservoirs. Um, and then this last area is just another neighborhood that was identified with, you know, with some of the densest development and the worst soils off of um, North Worcester Street here. So coming off of 123 and up North Worcester Street. I think the you know, at the time of the CWMP, the schedule was such that um, Wheaton um, was in the process of being connected um, while that was going on. Um, and then all the upgrades at the treatment plant were completed on or about 2019. So this was the, the, the um, schedule at the time. It kind of is a moving target and needs to be revisited, but we set it up. Um, the three-year increments with three years between, um, and the biggest thing on that was just affordability, being able to afford the extensions and not lump them all on top of one another as far as the, um, the debt schedule. Mm -hmm. so we went into areas six and parts of area seven already. Area seven was supposed to be 2024 through 26. We've already gone to, into a piece of area seven and, and moved ahead with that. So. If, um, and I don't know, you know, how much we need to go into any of this with them, but, you know, in terms of how they're, you guys are funding it, you guys are familiar with that between the sewer betterments and connection fees, um, capacity fees charged to those that own private capacity, the sewer user fees, and then we're using those um, 
annual payments uh, to Norton. Um, you know, the other funding sources that need to be considered are property taxes um, and maybe some district related financing specifically for the areas to continue along area seven um, on route 123. And really to date, you know, the reason we've done it the way we've done it is because of the advantage of the funding that we got from both, you know, Wheaton, the housing authority and bringing the sewers to the, the schools, you know, the North school and then the Yell school and the high school um, have really driven us to the point where we're at now. Um, and we've done it with limited to no cost paid for general <laughs> property taxes. That has been something that the town the select board has not had an appetite for doing that. So you have to be careful how quickly you move if you're not going to have the, the general tax base to support it. You got to be careful how you impact your user rate. So it's a little choppy. I put that together today. Um, I'll refine it a little, but that's kind of the presentation I was going to give them tomorrow. And I guess the, um, the main point being that, you know, the focus of the commission based on the CWMP it is really focused on that, you know, commercial district, that town center commercial district where you have the densest, um, you know, population of properties and a lot of the commercial properties. Uh, and then those dense areas around your drinking water supply, the reservoir. And, you know, the rest of the outlying areas of town, um, there are no plans um, to bring centralized municipal sewer to those areas. They're going to be dealt with um, in other ways. <laughs> Hopefully, they didn't have too much time. I kind of just launched into that, but I wanted you guys to see it before we present it to the EDC tomorrow. Yeah. That that meeting you guys have tomorrow is that a meeting that um, Steve Bernstein and I should specifically not be on on account of quorum issues, or can we log on and watch it as well? I don't think it's so. It's a published scheduled meeting. I guess I don't know how that works. It's not a big deal. I, if I could, I would like to watch it, but it's not a big deal. I'm sure it'll be on YouTube the next day. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I don't want to. I don't want to cause anything if I if I come on and have anybody say anything about sure. a forum issue. I'm not sure about that either. So I'll I'll just stay away. We can. Um, Thanks, Steve. So the report that you're you're reading from is that a published report that you're going to present? Oh well, yeah, this the actual CWMP document was published in 2017. Okay, that's what I saw. Okay, okay. I saw that before. Okay, yeah, I saw that. Yeah, and that's a massive uh, document. So, all right. Thanks, Steve. Thanks. Okay. So the only other thing, I know it's taken up a lot of time. The only other thing I think I had on, uh, so on Cobb Street, I did send, so we've been um, working on that based on the contract that we had that, and the initial projections that work was, you know, scheduled to be done at this point. Um, as you all know, we've run into issues timing and we're still a ways out from being, um, them being able to deliver the generator and install it. Um, I did submit um, an amendment, a request for an amendment to our contract, basically with, like I said, we're already beyond the time frame of when this work was supposed to be complete and we are at our contract amount and I'm looking to just get some more money in there so that we can continue. There's not a lot left to do, but just so that we can continue to support the project once it gets up and running again uh, and through completion. So that's something that, that Frank has, and you guys haven't seen it yet. So, you know, I, we can entertain it at the next meeting if you want to talk about it more. But, you know, basically we had a contract for um, 50000 The amendment is, is for 5000 just to give us um, the ability to, to finish this project. You know, which is going to be about three times, you know, in terms of time frame, three times longer than initially um, projected. And that's just overall schedule, you know, but not, not just. Do you anticipate another extension because of the delays for the, uh, I mean, particularly the generator, we don't know when that's going to happen, but the other work can't start until then. Is that something we should uh, you know, plan for, do you know? You mean the other work that's on the current contract? Yes. 
Um, no, I mean, I think everything's going to happen quick once they have the generator. It was never more than a few weeks of on-site work once they once they had the equipment that they needed. You know, it's 90% generator, and then it's just hooking it up and replacing some lighting and whatnot. They may even want to come in and do some of the other stuff before. There are some stuff, some things that they can do, but um, the generator is the big piece. Right. So I don't um, see it impacting that. I mean, they will need an extension themselves. You know, they, they, they're not going to meet the contractual time frames based on just the supply chain issue. So I assume that's not going to be a major issue. It's not like they're out there spinning their wheels and costing, you know, additional money. They're not, they just can't even be out there. They can't even get started. So there will be, you know, their, their contract is going to expire and we'll need to give them an extension. But that's, you know, in conjunction with what I'm talking about, I guess. So that's not an addition from our perspective. That doesn't mean that's kind of what I'm talking about in our amendment because they're going to need to extend it. So that's all. So like I said, I sent that to Frank today. Um, it's up to you guys um, if you want to have a chance to forward. <laughs> We don't. We, we we shouldn't anticipate any more um, any other changes. Then you don't think, Steve? In your estimation, I know you can't predict the what's going yeah. on. You didn't predict no, I, this. I don't think so. I think that should be it. Yeah, I, I think we should be good. Well, I have no problem uh, deciding or talking about more about that. A little more discussion about that. Gentlemen, do you have anything else uh, you'd like to add? Or I'm assuming we have to vote on this. So you will need to vote, yeah, in order to right. um, for it to be signed. That's um, what I thought. You can entertain tonight, or you can um, we can talk about it the next meeting. That's up to you. If you maybe, maybe we can uh, talk about it next week. Give us a little time to uh, yeah. talk. Yeah, that's right. that yeah. sounds good, guys. Yeah. Sure. There's, there's not much to it. I'm giving you the background. No, no, it really is just. It's taking a long time, and time is money. So we can um, we can answer any questions that you have. So, yeah. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Um, I believe we have um, the Island Brook uh, people here tonight. Um, I see a name I don't uh, recognize. Are they from um, TP Trail? Anyone out there from the TP Trail uh, group? No. Okay. So we'll um, head right into uh, Island Brook Utility Connection. Okay. State your name. Hi, Frank. So Hello. If you can all, if you can all see me and hear me, I hope Peter Freeman. Am I yes. coming through? Yes. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Um, some of you may recall me. Recall hey, me hey, from thank this, you. from this project and some others. But in any case, I'm the attorney for Island Brook. Uh, and I'm here just to reassure you, just because I'm here, it's not in any way intended or expected to be adversarial, just the contrary. You know, I know that Frank Gallagher, our engineer, and by the way, I don't know if he appears, but Muhammad Aitani, my client, the principal from Island Brook is also present. Um, but, you know, we wanted to, we need to go forward with both water and sewer. I'm told that the, the water is essentially worked out. Um, the thing that seems to be in need of discussion is the sewer. Um, so I just wanted to go over a few things, and then it does seem to me from what I have looked at with the correspondence emails with Mr. Fournier and Frank Gallagher and a few myself over the last month or so, um, you know, I think it seems like there's a way to do this. Um, just real real briefly, not to dwell on, on the legal, but, you know, the contractual <clears throat> aspects and the zoning aspects with the zoning board certainly are relevant because, as you probably know or do know, this is a comprehensive permit issued by the zoning board uh, under Chapter 40B. And in this case, they didn't simply defer to the uh, to the commission, to the Water and Sewer Commission. They actually gave uh, the permission right in the permit. I'm reading from it just a few lines. The applicant may connect to the municipal sewer infrastructure uh, and then the other place, couple of places, but they also say all infrastructure, utilities, roads, and stormwater management systems, sewer and water, shall be constructed as shown on the plans of record 
uh, as altered by Exhibit 2. Um, and, I, and I've talked to Frank Gallagher, and he could certainly screen share as necessary or have some back and forth. Um, but, you know, the plans that were approved, albeit a long time ago, you know, we certainly know that. Um, the plans that were approved and, and permitted by the Zoning Board of Appeals are the plans as now modified um, that are being presented to you over the last few months as, as well as tonight. Um, and, and by the way, you know, happy to discuss this. We do need action fairly quickly, but, you know, this takes some more review in terms of hopefully technical staff, but, you know, um, we just want to make sure we're hopefully on the same page. So that's the background of the comprehensive permit. Uh, and then the tri-party agreement, which I'm sure you all do recall or, or have familiarized yourself with for this particular project, that was to use some of the Red Mill Village um, capacity that wasn't going to be used uh, when that was completed, which it is. Uh, and so there's a tripartite agreement between you folks, my client, uh, Island Brook, and the Thorndike company. Um, so, you know, without getting that, and that was other than the, the, the part that I'm going to read in a second about, yes, my client has right to connect. Um, it was all about the, the allocation, how to measure <laughs> that um, and, and allocate the cost and share the cost. So, Paragraph 10, it says the commission, which is you folks, agrees that Island Brook shall be entitled to connect to the municipal sewer system for the gallonage described above, subject to approval of plans consistent with the commission's technical requirements and standard industry engineering standards. And then the rest is about the fees. So that's the basis for you know, my feeling and hoping that we should be on the same page, that my client does have a right to connect. The question then becomes, you know, how do we do that? And the two time factors I would say are um, that uh, we are told uh, that with MassDOT um, doing some paving, probably in the spring, they will be doing a second binder coat. And then uh, there could well be that five year um, delay moratorium, if you will, on opening up the road again for both our water and sewer uh, lines. Uh, it's probably obvious, but we all along have expected because I do think it's completely clear that the lines going up Route 123 to where we can connect, and I'll uh, turn it over to Frank Gallagher just briefly to explain that. They were always on the plans. That's what's approved. That's what the tri-party agreement's talking about. And yes, you know, the technical details, including possibly some stubbing for other homes, um, which again, I'll let Frank talk about that. Those are the things that certainly are on the table, but but not the question of, gee, you know, you don't have any right to put the line up uh, at, at our expense. We know it's at our expense, um, up Route 123. So I think that's basically the introduction that I wanted to give. And, and Frank, um, Frank Gallagher, if you can share the screen and just show uh, the lines in question. I, I will say one more thing. I think the most recent email from Frank Fournier to me and probably Frank Gallier, you know, Gallagher did talk about, you know, going up at 123 and connecting to an interceptor that's further up um, and I think is is one of the um, Mansfield, Foxborough, um, Norton uh, um, manholes or places where it could connect. With that, I'll just uh, turn it over to Frank for a few minutes for these technical plans. Okay, thanks, Peter. Um, gentlemen, I know we've met a couple times before and uh, I just, uh, you know, want to thank you for giving us an opportunity to come back and talk about this a little bit more. Uh, so I think, I hope that you all know what we had been planning. I know I presented it to you before and thank you for the approval you gave us on the water connections. Um, the sewer, I'd like to revisit um, because I know that we've talked about some options here and, and uh, this, what we've put in front of you, I think is our only real valid option. We have, we talked about the possibility of going out the back end of our development and connecting to the MFN sewer through that um, avenue. But we just can't make that work. For one thing, the wetland permitting would be pretty difficult given 
given the regulations that the town has put in place. And then we'd also have to secure a, the right to pass over another person's private property, which which we don't have, and we really don't anticipate that we'd be able to get. So, um, so I'd like to talk one more time about trying to come down Route 123. And um, we, we have talked about it, and I think uh, Frank Fournier has told us that, and I, you can correct me if I'm wrong, Frank, but if we are to uh, supply services to some of the properties that we pass by that aren't ours, then at that point, I guess we could justify saying that it's it's no longer a private sewer main and it's public. And we'd be willing to do that um, if that's you know what what the commission feels is necessary. So you can see on this plan that we essentially we have a pump station that you can't see that's up in this direction on our site. And then we run a force main from that pump station down. And then we we stay on our side of East Main Street all the way to where the interceptor line is, which is off the page in this direction. And when we do that, we pass by, I think, five private properties that we could provide services to. Um, so that would be five more people that would be able to connect to sewer. Um, so I guess that's what we'd like to put forth and, and discuss with you. And Frank, just to be clear, I know it doesn't show on the plan and I don't know how many linear feet it goes up, but can you explain if even if you can't show on the plan where you have intended, I think all along to connect to the Norton sewer? Yeah, let me just see. Um, Uh, okay, here's where I run into problems where I don't fully, un oh, wait a minute, maybe I do. No. Nope. Um, yeah, sharing the screen, that's something that's kind of new to me, so I'm trying to work my way through that, but let me see if this on is. Left, on the left taskbar, are those the subsequent sheets, Frank, if, if you click on oh, those? Oh, yes. Oh, okay, yep. Yeah. Okay, I see. Yep. You have all um, with miracle that I helped with something. <laughs> so yeah, this is continuing to run down um, East Main Street, and then this this plan will show. No, it won't. This plan, I'm sorry, will show uh, where we connect to um, to the um, interceptor line. This, this is the interceptor line. It runs in this direction. And we want it to connect right there at, at this uh, sewer manhole that's already in place. Is that a private manhole or is that is that the one that's coming from North Cottage? Looks like yes. that we spoke about. Yeah. But now I don't know whether or not that's private. It's, uh, you know, it's built right within the interceptor and it's it's built right on that main. So I, I mean, I don't know. It would seem to me that it would be part of the system now, part of the public system. I could be wrong. I don't know. I can jump in here, guys. So originally this was just the first set of plans that you guys had showed uh, to the board pre-COVID. Um, the issue that we see here um, is twofold. One is connecting a second private line to an already existing private line. We do not have permission to give you access to that line. If that line is owned by North Cottage, um, maintained by North Cottage, and it does include that uh, existing sewer manhole that's there. 
the sewer manhole is something that the MFN requires. You cannot directly discharge the sewer line into the MFN interceptor. Uh, that's something that was installed per their regulations uh, and is offset from the, the actual connection to the pipe. Uh, so I know we had talked about this prior. If you've spoken with anybody um, at North Cottage uh, for gaining access to their sewer line, and secondly, if the MFN would allow um, somebody to connect to something that is not currently owned. That may be something that's completely out of their jurisdiction, but definitely something that we would need to see letters in writing that they're going to approve additional flow coming in at one connection point. Um, you know, all stuff that's outside of something that we have control over. Um, the additional private sewer running down the road is is a secondary concern, which is why I know at one of the meetings, you know, other options were, were looked at. Uh, you, know, you, know, you know, moving forward, obviously, you guys are eligible for the sewer, um, but we can't grant you access through somebody else's private line. Just a quick thought on that as to the uh, MFN and, and that uh, uh, North Cottage, uh, the village, whatever it is, but you know, possibly being private. I, I'm not going to speak from the top of my head. I can check into that. It seems somewhat strange to me, as Frank, Frank uh, Gallagher inferred, that you know, if it's in the public way, there are certain public rights. But but that that's just speculation. So I appreciate you know your heads up, uh, Frank, on that. Um, as to the second comment, that's where I don't want it to be a disagreement, but I just cannot, I cannot agree. Um, you know, not only that, but you know, my client has paid his share as per that tri-party agreement for. I think it's five, six years now. Um, and he didn't pay that so that five years later, he could be told, well, no, even though all those plans that were approved by the ZBA and that we saw, and by the way, uh, your predecessor, uh, one or two supers ago was Bernie Marshall. And he was at the hearings with the ZBA and went over the plans and made suggestions and agreed mm -hmm. that, that agreed that those were the plans that, you know, would ultimately be the sewer plans to connect for this project. So I respectfully, but I can't agree at all, legally or pragmatically or fairly. Mr. Freeman, if, if you don't Can mind. Can I finish? Mm -hmm. Could I just finish? Uh, it'll be brief. Just just the fact is that all of the uh, all of the evidence and the contracts and the hearing process says that, yeah, we can put the sewer in, uh, you know, in Route 123. And there's no indication in the record anything about you no know, private sewers. I don't even think that has any legal meaning. And, and again, we're here to work it out. And I, you know, if, if there's a larger head, I still hope we work it out, but I'm not, I'm not gonna, you know, um, I just wanna be candid. And that's all I hope that we're all doing. These plans, were they approved by the Water Sewer Commission Board? Which is a requirement, I believe, by the bylaws. You're talking about the plans that Frank just went through? They all, everything that we have right here, but this was approved by the Board of Water and Sewer Commission. No, and it didn't need to be because the Zoning Board of Appeals on the chapter, chapter 40B gave us the permission to do it. The requirement was that we, we meet with technical requirements. A, a, and it would be, you know, I know Bernie Marshall isn't here, but as I say, it's not that the commission wasn't involved in the 40B process. Bernie Marshall was there. And so therefore, whether or not you commissioners or your predecessors were actively involved or reviewed, the answer is yes, they were reviewed the permit and permission to approve rather to allow the connection subject to just the final detailed plans was given by the zoning board under 40B. And that was the understanding all along. It was the understanding with the tri-party agreement. I mean, even your own document in terms of review the answer is essentially yes, because you said paragraph, uh, rather the commission, uh, page three, paragraph 10 of the tripartite agreement from October of 2015, the commission agrees that Island Brook shall be entitled to connect to the municipal seat sewer uh, with approval of the, of the plan subject to the technical requirements. And you have seen the plans back then. And, and the commission you're referring to is? The... It is the Water and Sewer Commission, from the commission. Tripartite you... agreement. Transfer sewer capacity from Thorndike Properties LLC to Island Brook LLC between uh, between Thornbike Properties, Island Brook LLC, and the North and the Norton Water and Sewer Commission. October 15th, 
uh, October 13th, 2015. Steve, a quick question? Sure. Um, if, if it says it has to meet the technical specifications, that would be that would be dictated by the water department. And that comes down to these plans. So if the water department, if this isn't meeting the technical specifications of the water department, well, I'm not no. sure how. No, 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 no. You but that say would that be we have to accept no, no, but that, would, that would be a charade and I don't want this in any way to be adversarial, but if I need to, I have to protect my client. There's no way that that would be interpreted to mean that you can just say after seeing these plans, after knowing Bernie Marshall and everything, that these plans were going down to be installed by my client for his project at his expense. Um, uh, technical in no way meant that you can now say after having seen these plans and the CDA familiar with them under 40 B, uh, it, it would be a complete charade respectfully to say, oh, but technical includes the fact that actually, even though we led you on and said that, you know, sure, these plans, you go ahead. Now you say you can't do it because it's private doesn't hold the light of day it won't be just respectfully it will not be upheld if that's the way you interpret it that's not what, what let me ask you this what, what would be acceptable as far as under the the purview of this meeting technical yeah. investigations well, well that's that's why you know if you have it for whatever reason it, and i think this should be settled pragmatically you know uh, the last thing i want is any legal battle um you know anybody who's worked with me i just you know was the attorney for the uh for the big one on 195 uh mansfield avenue that's going to be connected to the sewer um uh and you know and i've done other projects in norton uh, including as i said that one at uh 2 278 i think it is um that's completed further down the other side of uh, the highway um so so my point is that's why frank gallagher was mentioning and offering that if you think that there is a need for whatever reason to have our new sewer line accommodate existing houses. Um, and of course, you know, we don't, in terms of ownership, I think it makes more sense that it is the town, but that's up, you know, or you folks, but that's up to you, you folks. But that's why Frank Gallagher mentioned, if it helps the cause and it would help, uh, you know, monetarily for us to put in uh, uh, um, the stubs for that, um, that's where I say, and I hope that we wanna work with you. I, I have a question um, to uh, Frank. Um, Frank, as far as um, Mr. Freeman here, you you said that it was approved by the Zoning Board of Appeals. Was that right? Yes. So, Frank, if my memory serves me correct, and this is a question, I don't know the answer. Wasn't this sent out to legal review, not this exact case, but that Zoning Board of Appeals has no bearing on the water sewer commission's rulings are you asking frank gallagher a question about that uh previous i don't have the literature in front of me but as far as i recall they did not have jurisdiction over changes of policy uh regarding water and sewer ultimately falls under the bylaws uh, i have to dig up all of that information i remember this is something that was talked about quite a while ago um, but again, we're not denying availability to sewer here. We cannot give permission once again to a private sewer main. Um, you know, that is owned and maintained by North Cottage. You know, if that was the agreement that was done back in the day, that's fine. Show us some documentation for it and we'll move on. Um, but a better solution for everybody would be to install a main that's going to transmit wastewater and connect your property to the MFN interceptor based on their requirements, not our requirements, because we don't own the MFN interceptor. And if it fronts any properties, they should be able to connect based on the seven year time frame. Now, you mentioned there was a five year moratorium on the state road. I had heard that it could be 10. You know, I have seen nothing in writing either way, uh, but obviously, you know, either way, nobody's going to want to dig up that road, whether it's 10 or 15 years after it's completed brand new pavement, sidewalks, lighting, and all that. Uh, okay. You know, if I may. You guys can make these connections. It's never been, you know, that has been a target. You know, it's finding what's the best solution here. You're talking about a plan that's been in place since uh, 2013, maybe. I, I could be wrong with the date on that. But, um, you know, we're looking to make connections and make everybody, everybody happy here. You know, we're not looking for an argument. I don't understand the the angle that's coming across here. You know, we're not denying that you have capacity available. 
based on your tri-party agreement. We're just questioning the means of getting it from point A to point B. And we can't allow permission to tie into an inferior sewer main that's not owned by the town. It's not a municipal main, which seems to be the, the disconnect here. Okay, but, um, and I appreciate that, and that that's helpful. And I think there's, you know, fertile ground, to, as you said, we're here to try to work it out, which is what I said. So, but, but when you say that, I already acknowledged that I wasn't familiar with the potential legal permission needed up at that uh, MFN manhole uh, related to that private uh, entity, private uh, uh, residence. Uh, we'll look into that. But I think what you said a minute ago, picking up on what I've said and Frank said, Frank Gallagher, um, do you agree that we got permission up where Frank Gallagher just described on the plans that could connect, would connect to the MFN uh, manhole, whether it needs their permission and or uh, the, um, the private uh, residential property permission. But if we obtained the right to do that, it sounded like you would say, yeah, then we, we can put it up Route 123, which is what we've planned. If we provide connections for, uh, I believe there's five, Frank said, on our side of, uh, same side as our property. Is that is that what I think you said? That would be something that the board would have to vote on. I would support that type of installation. Um, it would obviously have to meet the current and future needs because this would be a line that would most likely be taken over by the town and added to at some point. That would be the whole goal of doing an infrastructure improvement. Again, this is something that would be looked at by the town engineers, uh, whether it be by peer review or just an overlook. Um, which would have to be required by the Board of Water and Sewer Commission. Frank, okay. Frank, also, I'm sorry to interrupt, Mr. Freeman. Uh, sure. If memory serves me correct, um, when Mr. Gallagher was presenting, uh, the biggest kind of roadblock we had anticipated, which is why we kind of um, had talked about tying in through the back of the property over there, was getting the sewer line installed into the road before the state project was finished, right? That was a factor that was, you know, that was a factor. I mean, that's what's driving us to try to get a resolution here. Really. We know that they're approaching a point where that's going to be completed. And, and, and Frank, either Frank really, but Frank, um, I mean, the water that's been worked out, the water lines, they're going, they have to go in before the, the, the paving too, right? Correct. So we think we can do that. You know, we know that that's our, our burden. But we, we think we can do that. Um, and, you know, if, again, being, you know, further technical review, uh, not knowledgeable enough to say how much um, detail Frank Gallagher has shown you, but, you know, if we can, you know, get agreement and, and have whatever's needed for Frank Gallagher to, to work on um, and have it peer reviewed if you want, which I understand, I mean, that's not an issue and just work out these kinds of technical details, um, then that's, that would be a go from our viewpoint with, with one caveat, which again, Frank Fournier, I appreciate, you know, all your details and forthright explanation. Um, when you say that it would, you know, have to take care of the, the present and future concerns, I mean, do you know the possible scope of would that change? You know, I mean, again, I'm a layman, lay person, you know, the pipes are the pipes. A lot of the work is just the digging and putting it in and repaving. Um, are there other technical things that, that you think would be needed to accommodate future growth? That could be handled with, by our sewer engineers uh, based on uh, a peer review or, or basic review of the plans, knowing what the future is going to hold in this area. Um, there's minor room for growth here other than obviously your project. Uh, we don't anticipate or we haven't heard of any other projects similar to that uh, coming down. Uh, we're kind of limited with the land and the wetlands that are here. Um, something that, uh, again, the, uh, the engineers would look at, determine if the size that you guys have, uh, you know, proposed here would work and uh, what would be the best outcome for everybody um, or if we had to increase the size to handle, you know, potential future growth mm -hmm. for this particular area. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the biggest concern here is that the Board of Water and Sewer Commissioners, per their rules and regulations, have to and can only sign off on finalized plans. So I think that's what Steve Bishop was getting at earlier. 
has a previous board signed off on a set of plans or have they only been proposed? Um, if we're talking about connections here that are going to change, these plans will go away, which was, I believe, what we talked about at our first meeting when the original set of plans were, were overlaid on the 1961 plans and not on the current mass DOT plans, which I believe you guys have corrected. But a change in the scope of work here um, on the slide that you're showing, if MFN is going to require a separate manhole to be installed or is going to have other some other type of uh, change to the plans, that would have to be presented to the board so that they would be able to sign off on a final um, set of plans that will be held true. You know, they couldn't sign off on this set of plans now showing a connection to the currently privately owned manhole and then two months down the road there's a set of plans that changes. You know, that's the way that the regulations are in place, whether that's how they were back when this project started, whatever it was, uh, but that's the way that they are, are now and I believe they were in place that way back then which is why Steve had asked about a signature. Yeah, no, I understand that. And, you know, I, I, I th theoret not theoretically, technically, if the rules were different back then, that's all on a 40B that we need to comply with. But that's not an issue. I'm not going there. The point is what you said is perfectly understandable. And of course, I have to talk with my client privately about everything. But um, to me, it's logical. And I understand uh, both common sense, sensically, never, never even mind those uh, rules and regulations, which because they're logical makes sense to me. Um, what I'm kind of, you know, I guess, um, kind of thinking out loud to suggest is understanding that, you know, there's work for Frank Gallagher to do working closely with you, I hope, and, and your peer review, and the, and the, I guess the actual uh, town engineers, you said, which of course is fine. Um, is there a way either tonight or meet again, but, you know, hopefully, hopefully tonight for there to be a, a vote from the commissioners of an agreement in principle that this is the route that we can take if we, you know, if we um, uh, have them reviewed and are acceptable uh, to, to the engineer and peer review um, and under the understood caveat that we would have to have whatever legal permission is needed for that FM, uh, MFN um, situation and uh and that um north cottage and muhammad not uh, sorry to interrupt myself actually before you folks answer but i mean muhammad if you want to talk privately perhaps they let let us take a you know short break and you know we could call each other but um time is still is of the essence but if it worked out that way um frank and muhammad does that seem reasonable to you yeah and if again uh, uh, it is. Uh, this is Mohammed Aitani. I'm with Stonebridge Homes and the developer of Island Brook. Uh, yeah, that's fine. Uh, there is a point that I would like to make to 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 actually make to the commission, and I believe there's there's uh, the, the ZBA in a 40B situation are the permitting authority for all the departments in the town. The the departments in the town get to make. Um, uh, they're, they're informed of the project, they sent their comments to ZBA, and ZBA is the only permitting authority in the town. So the, the technical review that the agreement referred to was only to make sure that the engineering work and the capacity of the pipe we're putting in the ground works and what kind of pipe it is, but it has nothing to do with the permit, with the permission to tie into the sewer system. So, so that's that's basically, you know, what the, what the case is. But I, I would, you know, Peter, if, if we can talk and and for a few minutes, if, if the commission, you know, will give us a couple of minutes, we can just. Sure, sure. Uh, we that, um, you know, I, I was just going to say that, um, you know, uh, what Mohammed said is right. But we've already been there, and I I don't I don't think in any way we need to go back that way uh, because um, the. The, the back and forth with Mr. Fournier and, and Frank and me seems to be to have been productive. And I'm not, as I say, I'm not here to really, you know, hammer legalistics and all of that. Um, and uh, if it's okay with you, because I guess the question is on the table, um, you know, would you be okay with a, uh, a kind of vote to, uh, uh, to affirm what I just said, which means you still have everything that you need and want, look at the plans, but it would be an agreement that yes, we can go this route that we've contemplated. 
So if, if it's okay, and I, I think um, to start to also be like a lawyer, like a municipal lawyer, I mean, if we take a break from this item, I, I think we probably shouldn't talk about it until we come back. Um, you know, so if you, I think two minutes is probably fine if that's okay with you folks, and I certainly appreciate it. So. <clears throat> Okay. That, that, that's okay. So we'll we'll come back in, in two minutes. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Yep. All right. Uh we can we can't talk about this for two minutes? No, we're not allowed to. Okay. Get in trouble. So uh Tara Tara, are you on? should be. Yes, I'm here. You got you got a, a, a quick two minute report? Uh probably not, but I can sum up a couple things in two minutes or so. Might be uh take up a little time, I guess, to one of the longest meetings we've had in a while. Yeah. So um okay, so uh, I can start off with Wells one and four. Um in last meeting, I updated that we had finalized our, our information, uh, our data collection. Uh, we've got some of the additional test results. We're finalizing our draft reports for your review. Hoping to have those emailed over to everybody before the next commissioner's meeting. Similar to what we did with Wells uh, 5 and 6, uh, we'd like to sit down and have an informational session with you to just go over all the documents, make sure you understand all the engineering involved with it and discuss a little bit about which wells might be most beneficial to uh, move forward with. Uh, well, four is, is certainly um, a viable option. We found uh, you know, two out of the three test wells look really great. Um, and uh, we obviously have a treatment plant that we'd be pumping to. So there's no real issues with well four. Should be able to, uh, you know, a new well there would uh, match the existing capacity if you have permanent for withdrawal there. Uh, well one is a little bit of a different story. Uh, the water quality is okay. Um, Obviously, it's a two and a half inch test well that we've run some samples on. That's not to say that over time your iron and manganese numbers aren't going to significantly increase. Um, so the thought would be that uh, we just want to talk with you a little bit about well four and next steps, as well as how you'd like to go with well one and move forward with that. So uh, I'll be sending out uh, probably next week just some meeting date options to set up a informational session. Make sure we get that posted and and have that uh, the date set for that. Uh, maybe sometime if it's I don't know if it's convenient or not to meet before the commissioner's meeting, the next meeting, or maybe uh, I'd like to give you guys a few days to at least re review the reports. They're kind of technical. So I was thinking maybe the week of the 22nd or even the following week, if that's easier. So I'll send some dates out in the next few days and we can set something up. Um, I don't know if Peter's back, so I don't know if he's ready to go again. Well, I, I am if it's uh, if it's a good time. I appreciate that uh, yep. break. Thank yep. um, okay, thanks. Um, so yes, uh, uh, my client uh, agrees with what Frank Fournier and I just said. Um, you know, it, it would be, I would say, binding in the sense that this is the route that you all agree we're going to go, but with the uh, understanding and the specific caveat that yes, the technical plans in terms of, um, you know, how it's built and the laterals, uh, tie-ins, whatever they're called, would be. And, um, and of course, that question on, on the MFN and um, uh, private uh, private entities um, connection place interceptor or manhole whatever it's called um, we, you know that that would be satisfactory um, and and I think reasonable and that's you know that's what I would propose. Uh, Mr. Gallagher, are you still here? Frank, Frank, can you unmute yourself? Right. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, uh, just curious, um, how did you guys make out with that um, DEP hearing you had to go to? I know that was kind of uh, up in the air. Yeah, um, it's still not completely settled. Um, we still don't have a decision. Uh, I think we've made a lot of progress. I think we're going to get a positive decision, but I can't tell you that we have one. Okay, it was just I think last time 
you had met with us. It was like the next week or something you were going in to meet with them. I was just wondering what you had heard. Yeah. And uh, we did. And uh, <laughs> they they put a, some, some new work on us, uh, asked us for some more information, some more design and calculations, which we've done. And we've submitted to them, and now they are reviewing it. So uh, I'm hoping that within the next few weeks we'll have a decision. But it's 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 in their time frame at this point. Will that happen to uh, change any of the uh, proposed plans at all with the work that you have going on? Not getting into detail, just asking. Yeah, it it won't it won't change what we've put in front of you. This is the final set of plans. Is that what I'm understanding? No, if, if, if both, both Franks. Um, I think what Frank said is that he thinks more is needed. I believe that these have been changed to conform to the new actual road that either has been changed over the years or is, is in the process. Um, but I'll, I'll ask Frank Gallagher, you know, to agree or, or amplify as to how much more is needed. And again, we're, We'll work with Frank Funnier, but Frank Gallagher, can you uh, amplify? Uh, so the question is, this set of plans that we've shown you of East Main Street, is are you asking, is that the final set of plans that you're going to see? Correct. Or are you talking about the development itself? No, I'm talking about these plans themselves. So these plans. I'm, I'm probably going to, I mean, if I... And I'm going to call MFN tomorrow, but if they say, well, no, that manhole that you're connecting to, you can't connect to, then I'm going to have a design change on this set of plans. And then also, if, um, you know, if we provide services to the abutting properties, I'm going to have to show those on, on this set of plans as well. So. I have a quick question about that um, as far as stubs for abutting properties. Isn't it a problem with this being a forced main? Are they even going to be able to connect to that? We, we talked about that earlier. They should be able to connect with a pump system similar to what we have down at um, uh, Norwood or, or uh, Winnicott Shores. It's a okay, low. So, so this isn't the same as a high pressure forced main over on. The Pine, Pine Street, Pine Street. Correct. Okay. Steve Peterson could weigh in on that a little bit more if he wants to get a little technical, if he's still on. Yeah, I'm still here. Um, yeah, he I mean, it's something we have to look at. There's definitely there's a distinct difference between a force main and a low pressure sewer. Um, and it, it will come down to the, the horsepower of the motors that are required for the development and how that's going to impact you know if you have these individual residents that you want to tie in with residential you know e1 or similar type grinder pumps um they'll have to be able to interact with with the pumps at the station all right okay oh so, uh mr gallagher maybe you we could, um, uh, speaking just for me, uh, maybe we can agree to accept uh, the new set of plans once you find out some more legwork with uh, with uh, the MF, certainly MFN is a big biggie, um, and that manhole as well for North Cottage, that private manhole, um, and then we can uh, we can vote on that, that that final set of plans. I'd be mm -hmm. comfortable with that if that's if that works as well. Uh -huh. uh, certainly, I, I, I understand we need to expedite, and we'll 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 do what we you know what we can certainly make that happen. Um, and when yeah. when is the next time that you meet? Uh, February twenty second, I believe, is the next meeting. Is that correct, Frank? Okay. That's correct. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I, 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 I um, if I may, just real brief, I, I think that's essentially what I was looking for. You know, a few a few minutes ago. Before the break, 
you know, that yeah, you would agree that we should do, Frank Gallagher should do the final plans on this route, you know, subject to the MFN. And if that's what you're proposing to say yes to tonight, uh, we agree. And uh, we know that, you know, the details will be coming and, you know, hopefully that won't be too big a deal, but it's engineering and reviewed and we all understand that. Is it possible, Mr. Gallagher, you could send me an electronic copy of these plans? I know the board had asked uh, to review the plans. We do have the hard copy set here that you provided to us, uh, mm -hmm. but unfortunately, as you can tell by the meeting, you know we're we're not able to join together and uh, review these plans. So it'd be something that uh, we could forward to the to the uh, commissioners uh, to actually be able to hopefully on their own time look through some of the plans. I can definitely do that. I'll send them out first thing in the morning to you, Frank. Yeah, that'd, that'd be great. Thanks, Thank Mr. you, Mr. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So that's the agreement then. I think, uh, you know, I think I'm very pleased and appreciate it. And um, unless you folks have anything, that's what we'll work toward. That is what we will work towards with a big effort by Frank, not me, Frank Gallagher. So um, unless there's anything else, thank you all very much. Thank you, Mr. Freeman. Thank, thank you. you. Good night. Thanks, Thanks night. everyone. Appreciate it. Thank you. Good night, guys. Thank you. Thank yeah, you, Mr. Yeah. Tani. All right. Um, Tara, you still with us? I am. All right. Um, you want to finish up your uh, your update? Sure. Thank I'm you. Attempting to turn my camera on, but for some reason it's not coming on. But that's, that's all right. Pretty pretty blue green and gray. Mm. I, I got a good background. <laughs> All right, so I, I kind of finished up a little bit on the Wells 1 and 4. Um, so just a real quick recap, we'll be sending the documents to you guys by the end of next week, hopefully, uh, and if nothing else, by the, uh, the 22nd, the next meeting date. And then shortly thereafter, we'll attempt to set up a, uh, an informational sense, uh, meeting, probably if, it, if it's okay to meet in person, we'll, we'll do it in person. If it's not still at that time, we'll do a virtual uh, but just so that we can kind of go through all the details that we found. Um, and as Frank's kind of already covered uh, the well three information, but I'll just do a quick recap on that. There was uh, 220 linear feet of ductile iron pipe, 12 inch ductile iron pipe installed to um, work on that four log uh, pipeline approval process. We submitted the application to DEP for the final certification that it was installed and properly disinfected and constructed on uh, last Friday. And uh, DEP is going to be on site on Thursday to inspect well three as well as well 5A. Um, so that that was working out pretty well. Um, 5A is Frank already up, up, updated. The electrician is going to hopefully finalize everything tomorrow. And if all goes well, the, we'll be able to start um, pumping the waste and, and take a bacteria sample. And um, DEP has been really uh, great in working with them and providing us with certifications shortly after our, our uh, applications go in. So. We've drafted it up. All we just need is that bacteria result and um, confirmation that everything's tested and, and we'll send them that certification. And hopefully, I mean, I don't want to put dates on it because I don't know how long it's going to take to get the bacteria form back. But um, hopefully by the end of next week, we'll have an application in and hopefully approved shortly thereafter. So I would anticipate five days going online uh, within the next couple weeks. Great. That kind of gets us into uh, Wells 5 and 6. We had the bid opening. We already talked about that at the last meeting. Uh, as an update, we went through our references and went through the documents that they had, that the contractor provided. It was dangerous. Uh, we had no concerns with their references. There was one small hiccup on their bid bond. Uh, however, uh, they have indicated that for the contracts, they will be providing performance and payment bonds with an A rating or better. Uh, it's just a formality, but we do require uh, no nothing less than A minus, A minus or less on on any bonds. So. We just wanted to work out with them in advance that they could, in fact, their surety could, in fact, provide a, a rating bond. So that's good to go. Uh, we had provided documentation to Frank via email, along with a recommendation to award. Uh, I think the board for this project, um, we had talked about it before, but the, um, the thought is to basically give Frank approval to issue the intent to award letter. And I believe in the past we have had the commission vote on that. So. Um, just to be clear, the uh, apparent low bidder was Dankris Builders Corporation. The total of their bid was $598,600. And we are, Weston Sampson is recommending award of the contract to Dankris. And we're recommending that the board 
vote to allow Frank to sign off on an intent to award letter. Okay. Yep. Okay, and this is, um, I just want to give the name of the company. Correct, Dankeris, you said? Dankeris, D-A-N-K-R-I-S, Builders Dankeris. Corp. Dankeris Builders Corp, okay. And we are, <clears throat> this is for Frank to sign the intent to award letter to them. Correct. Okay, um, I move that we allow Superintendent Frank Fournier to sign the intent to award letter to Dankeris Builder, Builders Corp um in the amount of five hundred ninety eight thousand six hundred dollars i second uh, all in favor aye. aye aye thank you jim mm -hmm. thank you tara yep no problem um white street uh the water main design i'll, I'll pretty much have that wrapped up hopefully in the next two weeks as well so uh, i believe um Steve Bernstein had asked for a set of plans. We'll, we'll get a copies, uh, hard copies and electronics to everybody uh, in the commission and the water department for a final review prior to uh, setting a bid date. Okay, thank you. And that's, I tried to get under 10 minutes. I think I did six maybe total. You but, did, uh, we, 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 good. we hurried you right up, that's why. If anybody has any questions, just let me know. But otherwise, we're looking uh, we're looking good for certifications with the EP and that's everything goes well this week so that's big Tara, how many bidders did you have uh on the award we just made for 598 how many people uh, bid on that job we had two and the other bidder was just over seven hundred thousand. thank you mm -hmm. i just bid a job and the uh two bids came in within uh, five hundred dollars from each other wow wow <laughs> I usually am. I'm usually the low bidder. This time I wasn't, so I was oh. just asking. Them. <laughs> yeah, we we're hoping for three, but there's only a few companies that have typically in the last several years been bidding. So on the well work, I should say. Well, I know that I've worked with Dankers before, and they're a very good company. Yeah, good. good. They've done so. Where are they out of? Uh, they're uh, uh, technically. Um, they out of Plainville. I think Plainville, isn't it? Yeah. I believe so. Plainville. Thank you. All right. Uh, so we already got our next meeting, which is February 22nd. Uh, does anyone else have anything uh, old business or new business? No. Or I have a question about the filter program. Sure. So um, I want to, I've been uh, catching up on uh, looking at our website and looking at our regulations and look, that's why I've asked all these questions over the last couple of days. Frank, on the filter program, how many people have taken advantage of that the rebate? I believe we probably are somewhere around three or four. Three or four, okay. Yeah. And do we? And uh, I just got a quote from a company to install it, so I was just curious whether or not that was in line. Is there any way to? Um, do we have any idea about that? What the cost to install these filters are out in the world? No, I and mean, I guess it's going to depend on the plumber. Um, if you're handy, you could install it yourself. Um, you know, it's something that we don't recommend unless you obviously know exactly what you're doing. But um, you know, the uh, the basic whole home filter, you know, is in typically installed in the basement directly after the water meter. Um, they do make some uh, uh, pretty easy to use coupling devices now, whether it be shark bite or, or a compression fit. So uh, it is definitely getting to be something that the average homeowner can do. Um, whether they want to take on that responsibility themselves is completely up to themselves. Yeah, I, I consider myself handy, but plumbing is not one of those things I do. So uh, that's why I've worked at a company to install. I was just curious, that's all. Thank you. Yeah, there was, like I said, there's probably, you know, three, four, maybe five people. Um, I've had quite a bit of questions on it, uh, going back and forth through email, asking about uh, filters that we would recommend, which is not something we will do. Um, each person has their own, um, I guess, solution that they're looking for based on a filter. Uh, we have differences in diff depending on where you're located in town. A few people have called, indicated that they uh, they smoke chlorine, which is what we use for disinfectant. You know, where a simple GAC filter, like what's commonly found in a refrigerator, would work. Um, and other people that deal with, uh, you know, sediment or uh, or light yellow color or an orange color. And uh, we've actually uh, made it a point to get into a few of these homes that have had 
um, problems in the past and you know knock on wood the system out in front of their home has actually been very clean so we've gone numerous times to different places sometimes repeat locations showed them water samples from water taken from a hydrant after turning it on and compared it to what people see in their home um, a couple of these locations it was uh, found after spending a little bit of time inside the home that a portion of their water service was still an existing old service an iron service um, where the you know the lead gooseneck was removed out in the street it was upgraded as part of our water main going by and, and having um, shown a connection to copper but somewhere along the line there was a change somewhere in the front lawn or in the driveway um, and the old pipe was left in place which is what has been you know a problem for a few of these locations not everyone but you know, we've definitely dealt with it being an older town that we see some of those things. And, uh, you know, again, we're not going to recommend a specific filter because everybody's needs are a little bit different. Thank you. Well, I'm all set. And, okay. Thanks, Steve. Uh, before we go, I just want to say, uh, Brooke, uh, good job on the minutes. Uh, yeah. Very clean, and uh, we appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yeah, I agree. Excellent Thank job. You. Thank you. And uh, with that being said, Jim? Okay, I move to adjourn our meeting for this evening. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Have a great, great weekend, everybody.